All right. I hope everyone enjoyed our theme music. There's a little move music for you. Welcome to our Crisis Jam. It is 9 a.m. on the West Coast, noon on the East Coast. Um, and so it is time for our Crisis Jam. Uh, and today we are going to be focusing on uh, 911 and EMS. So we have a very, very special edition of the, of the Crisis Jam today. Next slide. So just want to bring your attention to our numbers. Uh, we still have our highest showing for the, the uh, 713 uh, version when we had um, Assistant Secretary Delta Rittman on. So we're still chasing that number. We are well over 3,000 now, uh, strong, uh, 3,000 3, strong in our Crisis Jam Learning Community with 3,013. So we're very pleased about that. If there are people that you still know need to be on this call that you have not seen show up here, by all means, get the word out to them. Um, and invite them to the Crisis Jam. If the Crisis Jam has disappeared from your from your calendar, we hear from people every now and then that they, they no longer get the uh, the invite. You can always click here on the you, you see the click here on the to, to download the Crisis um, Crisis Jam event. Uh, you can always go to our um, Crisis site. Uh, the, you also have the Zoom link here where if you, if you click on the Zoom link, you get access to all the resources, you get access to the, uh, the prior crisis, crisis jams. Uh, so all the videos, information is there. So we invite you to do that. Uh, you also get the, um, the, the, the recent articles and things that we have featured on the, on the crisis jam. So it's a wealth of opportunity, a wealth of information there. And I believe that the link was just dropped into the chat. So if you want to click on the link, uh, you can make sure that you have access to our Crisis Jam. And we are fast approaching, believe it or not, our 100th Jam session that will be coming up on October 12th. And other, at that 100 Jam session, we're also going to be shifting gears and doing something a little bit different uh, called the challenge. I don't have all the details on it yet, but I understand that it is going to be very special. Um, so I encourage you to continue to tune into all the crisis gems, but, but by all means, plan on being with us on October 12th uh, for the challenge. Next slide. Uh, we do have one event um, in the uh, latest crisis news, and that's joining us on September 12th, as we, um, uh, and that is the, um, the um, celebrating the, the launch of, of 988. Um, so we invite you for that. We also do want to make sure that uh, we remember that on September 10th, that is World Suicide uh, Prevention Day. So we want to make sure that we uh, tune in for that. But the um, on September 12th, I'm sorry, September 12th, there will be a special celebration of 988 uh, that's being presented by the National Council for Mental Wellbeing. That will be Chuck Angolia, Kim Williams, uh, James Wright. So we want to encourage folks to tune in for that. It'll be a look at kind of where we where we are with the, with the 988 um, number, but also how we got here and celebrating the rollout of 988. Our quote for today, and this comes from uh, a 1966 article uh, from the National Ac Academy of Sciences. Expert consultants returning from both Korea and Vietnam have publicly asserted that if seriously wounded, the chance of survival would be better in the zone of combat than on the average city street here in the United States. And that's a, that's a heavy statement, but it's also a good segue um, into our presentation for today. We are very happy to have with us Kate Elkins. Um, uh, and Kate is, gonna, is really gonna dive a little deeper into this and, and really give us some context around what this means to kind of where we are and where we come from with our, with our 911. So Kate, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And, and we can go to the next slide. Um, I am an EMS and a 911 specialist at the Office of EMS, which is housed in the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. The reason that our office exists and actually predates NHTSA is that Sentinel report in 1966. And so um, <coughs> we recognized that we were doing a better job of caring for casualties in combat than we were caring for civilians on our roadways. And so our mission is to reduce death and disability. Um, we really work on building these evidence-based systems that are comprehensive and interoperable for EMS and 911 because you need a, a number to call 
and you need people to respond and you need the right help at the right place at the right time. Next slide, please. So EMS or emergency medical services and 911 systems really practice at the intersection of public safety, public health, emergency management, healthcare, and crisis response. We are a safety net for so many different things. When there is an emergency and you call 911 for whether it's your house is on fire or there was a crash or somebody's delivering a baby, you know, <laughs> there are all these different things that happen. And we really have those resources that respond quickly to provide the right care at the right time in the right place. But we recognize that there are other systems that we collaborate with that really help us to do the best work. And we have to be working and integrating with these other systems in order to do the best for the people we serve. Next slide, please. So over time, in 1966, there was a Sentinel white paper, but we've had to evolve, we've had to develop. And what we've really done is we, in 2019, um, we released Agenda 2050, which is our vision of the future for EMS and 911, really coming together and focusing on people-centered care, making sure that we're following evidence-based practice, that we are socially equitable, it's reliable, it's integrated and seamless with other systems, whether it's a crisis care system, poison control centers, the hospital systems, public health, emergency management, being able to really take all the resources within a community and provide the right care in the right place at the right time for all the people that we serve. Because we oftentimes, unlike an emergency room, unlike a hospital setting, we're in patients' homes, we're on streets where the crash has occurred. We are potentially also responding to all different issues and, and incidents. So we get to know some of our population. We're part of the community. We also get to know some of our patients really well. And so by integrating with these other systems, we provide better care for the person and focus on the people. Next slide, please. So when somebody calls 911, what happens? So a public safety telecommunicator answers the call. They gather information. They really are set protocols or there's a sort of a script that oftentimes is used. Only about 50% of the 911 centers can do emergency medical dispatch, but every 911 center has some sort of protocol or procedure that they follow to gather the information. Now recognizing time is really critical for a lot of emergencies. When you call 911 and your house is on fire or your wife is in labor and might deliver a baby any moment in your car, you want to make sure that those responders know where you are and that you can get that right help at the right time. Telecommunicators can bridge that time from the call being received until the time that the first responders arrive on scene. Whether it's gathering information um, for providing clinical care to a person until EMS arrives or getting information about a house fire or a crash location, any number of incidents that they're getting a call for. So they have very strict rules for how quickly they need to answer and start to distribute these calls to those first responders and get help on its way to respond. Next call, next call, wow, next slide please. Um, what they do then is they give information to the EMS clinicians that are responding. And I want everybody to understand, I'm still an active paramedic, EMTs, paramedics, emergency medical responders, advanced EMTs, we all have training for a variety of, of issues. One moment you might respond to that car crash, you might respond to a drowning, you might respond to a cardiac arrest, you might deliver a baby, you might be talking to somebody having a panic attack, you might be dealing with somebody in crisis, you might be dealing with somebody who's homeless and now has a heat emergency. There are multiple different patients that you encounter in a single day. You can oftentimes go from call to call to call and have a real variety of what you see, depending on where you practice. We're trained to walk into the chaos, assess it, determine life threats, manage those life threats, and then start to figure out what resources do we have, does our community have to take care of the situation. Unfortunately, in many settings, we are limited by our protocols and our medical direction. So we may not be able to take a patient 
to alternate care destinations if that's not allowed in our protocols. We may only be able to take them to the emergency department. And it really varies and it depends on the location, their protocols, and how their system is designed. But all of us are trained to walk into all different situations and manage the crisis or the emergency, I should say, to manage the emergency. Next slide, please. When we go and we start talking, and we in emergency medical services, we'll oftentimes call people patients because most of our patients we're looking for medical emergencies with. Um, there are some jurisdictions that are doing better and starting to call them clients. It really depends on the setting and it depends on what you're doing. But we are going to assess for life threats first. We need to make sure that their blood sugar is stable, that they are not having a cardiac event, they are not having other issues. Um, and then we also will talk to patients and figure out, you know, is this somebody who it's appropriate for them to be in this medical protocol or that? Are we transporting them to the emergency department? Are we able to have them refuse and stay home? Are there other resources in our community? Now with the advent of community med paramedicine and mobile integrated healthcare, we have more and more resources that we're able to leverage. Many of these communities are now doing co-responder models, but that is not everywhere. There isn't mobile integrated healthcare everywhere. There isn't community paramedicine everywhere. There aren't co-responder models or mobile crisis response in every community. In communities where those responses don't exist, oftentimes emergency medical services are that mobile entity that can be sent to a home. So we oftentimes become that safety net for multiple systems. Next slide, please. So most of the training for emergency medical clinicians is focused on assessing, treating, potentially transporting a patient to definitive care. We have limited information and a limited amount of time. We don't automatically have access to the patient's health records. We don't automatically have access to their medical history or medications. We might not even know that they were transported yesterday by a different agency, a different crew or a different um, entity. We don't necessarily know any of the information about their calls to a crisis line, their calls uh, with mobile crisis. So there are some challenges in not having that data integration with patient records so that when an, a crew walks into a situation, oftentimes all of the data they have is what they're obtaining in that interaction. And we have limited amounts of time because most of our training is focused on stabilizing and moving to those appropriate resources. Um, we can do that without transporting to the emergency department. There are plenty of times that we stabilize patients in the home and they stay in their home. However, that really is limited by the jurisdiction, their protocols, and what they are allowed to do within their protocols. Next slide, please. So in some jurisdictions, the only option that a paramedic will have is to go to an emergency department with a patient. In other jurisdictions, they have expanded that and they can go to urgent care centers, they can go to crisis stabilization centers if they exist. Some places are doing direct access to psychiatric care centers, but that is not the norm. The norm across the country has been that the protocols limit where EMTs and paramedics and other EMS clinicians are able to take patients. As a paramedic with 25 years in EMS, I know that there are times when I'm taking a person because I can't leave them at home to the emergency department, but that might not be the best solution for them. So we need to partner between our organizations and those who are building this new crisis system to make sure that we're engaged so that our protocols are evolving as their resources in our communities evolve, that we're at the table and the community understands the resources we bring to the table, our community engagement, our prevention programming, our work in the community to provide the right care at the right time, the right place, so that as stabilization centers are opened, as there are more options, as mobile crisis evolves, we're able to collaborate and integrate our systems so that we get the right benefits to the people who need it most in their time of crisis. Next slide, please. EMS data can be a really valuable tool. Every paramedic or EMT that interacts with a patient is required to provide a patient care report. 
all of those patient care reports are done in a system that is based on a standard that comes out of the national EMS information systems, which is managed by our office. What's really cool is that that data goes into the local region and then up to the state and then ultimately up into a national data set. We are able to use that national data set at ISTE identified to really do some cool surveillance and to better understand what is going on in our communities. Each paramedic or EMT or EMS clinician enters in that information into these um, electronic patient care records. And it can be very quickly moved into those data sets. Next slide, please. So we are really excited that all 50 states are submitting to the National NEMSIS database, and that gives us a richer amount of data. We have a really significant volume, millions of reports, in order to look at and do research and evolve and improve the care that we provide as EMS clinicians. Next slide, please. So here is some data that looks at the number of behavioral health or mental health activations over the denominator of all the 911 patient care activations by year. So um, we're looking at about 8% of the patient care um, activations. And that's not an insignificant volume, but that's also a, a percentage that is not an overwhelming percentage of our calls. It's really important. It needs to be addressed and we need to take the time to integrate these systems um, to really help learn using this data as we evolve into a more integrated and more resource system for crisis response. Next slide, please. So the future really is evolving. We have systems in our community where paramedics and law enforcement have partnered in doing co-responder models. There are co-responder models using paramedics or EMS clinicians, the 911 center, um, they're referring um, to 988 or to crisis centers. Some are referring to nurse triage lines. Some are also um, collaborating where there is law enforcement, there is not law enforcement, there's faith-based organizations, there are other community organizations. Um, and some existing community paramedic programs and mobile integrated health programs are now able to pivot and they are taking care of their cardiac patients um, who've recently been released by, from the hospital, but they're leveraging some of those same resources to turn and be a resource for crisis response as well, where there isn't a mobile crisis response um, entity in their community. So there's a lot of opportunities for collaboration, but recognizing that there is this pre-existing community engaged response that has been a safety net for years and years for this population. Next slide, please. So we have some challenges for EMS and 911, and I'm going to really quickly fly to the next slide because <laughs> I'm running out of time. Um, we have challenges with our workforce. Our workforce is short-staffed, both for EMS and 911. Um, they have been overburdened and understaffed for a long time. It predates COVID. The COVID response has put an incredible stress on our system. We lost thousands of first responders to COVID. Um, and so it's been a real challenge to maintain the response that we have consistently done. Um, there's a running joke that in EMS, we do a lot more with a little bit less every year in some ways. We have stresses on our workforce from what they see, what they encounter. We have the challenge of preventing PTSD, suicide, and other mental health consequences of the impacts of their job for both EMS and 911. We have a educational standard that is the floor for EMS and the scope of practice that is the floor. And then we build upon that. And each individual state and locality can have innovations above and beyond that. Um, but we need to expand our education on mental health, on suicide prevention. And in the most recent iteration of the education standards, we did that across the board, but there is still plenty of room for improvement. Finances, we have significant challenges with financing EMS. Um, most people don't realize that EMS is only an essential service in 11 states. Uh, they don't necessarily get any tax-based funding in some states. They, the reimbursement for transport does not cover the cost of doing business or the cost of care. There are challenges with being interoperable between jurisdictions, between states, between 911 centers. 
And then finding the person can sometimes be a, a challenge. It's really important to realize we have parts of our country that don't have 911 fully established yet. Um, there are places that don't have addresses and 911 systems to call. They're still calling 1-800 numbers or 10 digit numbers. We have places where the only EMS is volunteer provided. They are super strapped. Their staffing is getting older and there's nobody in the ranks to come behind them. So some of our rural communities have serious concerns that when this generation retires, who's gonna fill those shoes coming next? So we have a lot of work to do to really strengthen our EMS and 911 systems. They have very limited funding coming from the federal government as well as you know, how are they funded locally? How is your local agency funded? And are they having bingo nights and bake sales to pay for that next new ambulance that they need to buy? Um, it's something that's important to understand. Next slide, please. Um, I do a lot of work on suicide prevention among our first responders. We're grossly overrepresented. I have lost nine of my peers in 25 years, and that is far too many. So that's what I will say for that. We're going to go on to the next one. We're doing a lot of work to improve the culture within our community. Next slide. So my closing thoughts, EMS and 911 systems are critical components of crisis response. Please engage with them. Please engage with your local state EMS organizations. We need to be partnering to provide the best help possible. EMS and 911 has a culture of wanting to help, of wanting to save lives. We have moral injury when we take a person to a place that isn't giving them the care that they really need. It is important for us to build these systems so they're integral, so that we're working together and we are collaborating to do the best thing for our people who call us. Um, building relationships can really result not only in expansive the systems, but when you meet that paramedic or EMT who is an advocate, who is tired of running those suicide attempts, who is tired of encountering those people who are not getting the help that they need, they can be great partners and advocates for prevention. Next slide, please. If you want to know more about my office, we manage two websites, 911.gov and EMS.gov. We are always happy to collaborate with other entities, with um, our peers in federal government. We do a lot of work to educate about EMS and 911 across the country at all levels. And it's really important. 911 and EMS are all regulated at the local and the state level. They grew up local. They still are local. Um, but we have fabulous partners and we can make connections with our partners at the local, state, and national level for both entities. My contact information is on the next slide if you need to reach out to me. But I understand we have a fabulous panel of some of my expert peers to follow. So, Kate, thank you so much. That was a fabulous uh, presentation, a lot of information. I learned uh, some things. I had no idea that 911 was only considered essential um, in. 11 states. That is just that's EMS. EMS, EMS is essential. I'm sorry. The EMS, yeah. the EMS is only essential in seven states, but that's still that is that is just mind boggling to me. Yeah. EMS it's is essential much. in 11 states at this moment in time. Uh, we're hoping that will expand. But um, yeah, we we assume we had a survey in 2018. Everybody assumes that 911 can tell your location, 911 is going to give you pre arrival instructions. That's not always the case. Only about 50% of 911 centers can get pre arrival. And I think people assume that EMS is well-funded and that it's a requirement in your community. You know, and unfortunately it's not. Well, you know, also it, it is, I think it's very fitting today. And I just want to take a moment to, um, to recognize our, our friends that have joined us today from the CIT International Conference in Pittsburgh. And I think we have roughly 80 people in the room there. And, <laughs> <thank you. laughs> So welcome, and I think I think it is only fitting that uh, that we have them join us today uh, because we we cannot say enough about um, how much we appreciate our first responders, and and also along those lines, I was really pleased to hear uh, some of what you shared about some of the supports around mental health because one of the the things that always comes to mind for me is vicarious trauma, um, and especially thinking about uh, how many first responders we lose to suicide. So I'm glad that those supports are there. In fact. Um, uh, just yesterday was uh, National Grief Awareness Day, um, the day that's set aside to recognize people that have suffered loss. And, um, and so I, I would encourage people, even though it was yesterday, 
uh, be mindful of our first responders and the things that they go through and the loss that they have have endured over the years. And, and Kate, I'm so sorry to hear about your losses of um, nine of your peers. So, uh, so at any rate, though, I will because I could talk to you about this all day. So I want to get to our roundtable. We have three guests joining us for the roundtable today. We have Sandy Stroud, who is um, Minnesota 911 program manager. Uh, Dia Gaynor, who's executive director of the National Association of State EMS Officials, and uh, Daniel Gerard, who is the president um, of the International Association of EMS Chiefs. So we have some experts uh, to respond today. So I'm going to turn over to our uh, roundtable for their comments. And Sandy, shall we start with you? Great, thank you. Um, it's really exciting to be here. Um, you know, one of the things I put a couple comments in the chat because I saw some really great questions and some interactions about 911 and 988. Um, I have had the honor to be involved um, and partner with our Department of Health uh, and have co led the 988 911 interactions initiative in Minnesota. And was involved in our policy academy. So shout out to any of our policy academy of folks that might be at this in the CIT audience right now. Um, but I think that what we have really learned and, and some of the key takeaways really are, and, and I, my husband's an EMS um, uh, colleague of your guys', is so, um, and he has said to me, he goes, you've seen one EMS system, you've seen one EMS system. And it's the exact same way with PSAPs. Um, you know, in Minnesota, we have 86 primary PSAPs. None of them are the same. None of them have the same resources. Um, some of them are one seat PSAPs. And so, um, some of them have very robust co-responder models. So I think that as we have traveled this path, um, we have had to address that uniqueness um, between 988 and 911. And I would you know, echo that one of the most important things to do is to get 988 and 911 folks talking together. Um, and, and we've been doing that and we've seen a lot of great successes from that thus far. I did see a question um, in, in the chat, Sandy. Uh, someone asked, what are PSAPs? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I, I will use a lot of lingo, unfortunately. So please do not hesitate to say, could you slow down and just tell me what that means? Uh, so PSAP stands for Public Safety Answering Point. That is the local 911 call center. Um, and what I'll share is that actually across the country, um, the geography that binds a PSAP or what is a PSAP could be very different. Um, in Minnesota, we have PSAPs that are county-based. Um, sometimes you have a county-based PSAP, and within that PSAP, you have um, city-based PSAPs. Um, in other parts of the country, you'll have a PSAP that accepts the call first, but they only dispatch law enforcement, and a different PSAP has to get the call to dispatch EMS and fire. Um, so when we talk about PSAP, it's the public safety answering point. But it could mean who dispatches the call, but it also can mean who gets the call first. Thank you. Uh, Dia, shall we pivot to you? Do we have Dia? Let's go then to Daniel. Hi, uh, my name is Dan Gerard. I'm the president of the International Association of EMS Chiefs. Um, and I, in my uh, day job, I'm the EMS coordinator for a fire department in Northern California um, that we provide EMS for for the community in addition to community paramedic and a uh, crisis mobile response. Uh, unit as well. Uh, and we prefer not to call it a crisis mobile response unit. We actually call it a care team um, because perception is reality until change. Uh, I think one of the most important things, and especially for the lay people or the people that don't have familiarity with EMS out there, I think one of the most important things I could kind of point out to you is we talk about service delivery models. And I think that uh, SAMHSA has kind of done a good a very good job of, um, you know, in their uh, resource toolkit of kind of highlighting the essential element 
of elements of the service delivery model that they purport. So, you know, when we talk about systems of care, and especially when we talk about EMS systems, if I said to everybody here, raise your hand if you call a single three-digit number to call for help, um, everyone here would raise their hands and say, yeah, I call 911 for help. Um, if I said to everybody here, does uh, a first responder come to your house, everybody here would raise their hand and say, yeah, you know, and sometimes it might be the police department. A lot of times it's the fire department, but you know, there's going to be somebody that's fairly close. That's going to respond. And then I, I'm going to say, does an ambulance come with EMTs and paramedics? And everybody here would raise their hands and it might be a private ambulance service. It might be volunteer. It might be the fire department. And then if I asked them if they transport the patient, especially center of care, they would say, yes, the EMS system is the EMS system. It's the same throughout the United States. It's the service delivery model that's different. And it's going to, and it's, we see those same things for our care teams, for our crisis mobile units. So, you know, it's really important that needs assessment, who the players are and what their capabilities are. I don't have the expectation in rural and frontier areas that they're going to be able to field licensed clinical social workers for every response. But, you know, we have technology that we could leverage through uh, FirstNet, which would be like a HIPAA compliant um, methodology in order to make patient contact and do real time video. There's a couple of different options that are available to us. Uh, in some communities, the police do not want to go on these responses anymore. Uh, and I can understand that, but they have to be part of the discussion and they have to be part of your response model, especially when things take um, an unfortunate turn. So when we think about systems, right, systems are uniform. The EMS system across the United States is uniform. It's just the service delivery model that's different. And it's the same thing. We're going to see the same thing for our, for our uh, care teams, for our crisis response units. And it's knowing what our capabilities and capacities are that are very important. So thank you so much for that. Thank you to our round, our round table. Um, and did, did we have Dia, uh, Dia going once? Dia going twice? So thank you, thank you so much to our, our roundtable participants. Um, and we're going to pivot a little bit more uh, now to have a little bit more discussion on this. And Kate, I, I, you know, there were several things. And I, we'll, we'll touch a little bit on this in, in, as we talk going forward. But some of the things I think that really uh, stood out to me, both in your presentation and then the comments from the roundtable, is just to focus on efficiency and speed and safety. But then also that uniformity, which I would imagine can be challenging, being that EMS is so locally driven. And, you know, for me, um, having been born and raised in a very rural community in, in um, Eastern North Carolina, yeah, I recognize how those things can look very different in an urban versus rural community. Um, so, um, and we may touch on that a little bit as we talk uh, a little bit more about uh, the 50 years of modern EMS. And I know now this is, we're probably closer to 55 years of modern EMS. And and um, so we're going to talk a little bit about this timeline uh, that's on the EMS website. Uh, and I see here we're going from the 70s to the 2010. So, uh, so take it away, Kate. Talk, tell us a little bit about this. Well, so with that Sentinel white paper, we really started to build a system and it's a system of systems. It's all built up locally and through some initial, this initial accidental death and disability paper recognized that we, we had a way to do things better. We knew the military was providing better trauma care to casualties abroad. And if you crashed your car on a highway here in the United States, you weren't as likely to survive as if you were injured in Vietnam. So what's really important is to recognize that we learned lessons from the military medicine and from those who came back with this incredible knowledge of trauma and we, we took action. So they ended up funding um, the the Office of EMS predates NHTSA. Um, we've been in NHTSA since the start, but through this funding, what they ended up doing is 
realizing we need to build a system of systems. It's going to be local and state based, but we need to provide better care because we know we can. We know that there is the ability to save these lives and reduce injuries on our roadways. So in 1973, with the Emergency Medical Services Act, we really started to push for improved resources, improved systems, building up these systems, and then recognizing that we need to have educational standards. We need to have a basic foundation for all of our EMS clinicians to sort of rest on. And so we are building up with this curriculum that has been reiterated and redone. We Our office puts out the educational standards and the scope of practice. This is the floor that across the country can be adopted and built upon by states and localities. So um, not every state is simply going to stick with the um, scope of practice as it's written or the educational standards as they're written. Oftentimes they're building upon them. But in the most recent iteration of the educational standards, we had the opportunity to increase the requirements for mental health and suicide prevention education at all levels for EMS clinicians. And we continue to partner and engage with our community to improve the resources and education for our clinicians so they better provide for the patients they encounter. Um, because there's nothing worse than feeling helpless and not having the tools, the resources, or the education you need to take care of a person who's called you in to help. So uh, in addition, uh, Secretary Mineta in 2004 um, was pioneering and recognized that whenever a plane, train, or an automobile crashes, we call one number. Mm -hmm. But who's looking out for 911? Who's advocating at, for 911 at the federal level? And so the office um, started the National 911 program here at NHTSA. We collaborate with NTIA out of commerce on some grant programs and projects. And really it gave 911 a de facto federal home, much like EMS has a de facto federal home in NHTSA. And recognizing that having that system of systems that are built locally, managed at the local and state level, integrate collaborate, evolve, and evolve based on evidence is really important. Our office provides resources to help states and locals to do things that they wouldn't be able to do. For an EMS, we help with evidence-based guidelines. We help do the literature reviews and build the technical advisory panels to build evidence-based guidelines that then states can adopt to use evidence-based clinical practice with their clinicians. On the 911 side, we build tools for 911 systems to better interoperate, to better evolve, to improve their training, to improve their professionalism, so that they are able to answer those calls with the right technology, find the right location, and send the right help. Because we also recognize that if you are that person who's a helper and you don't have the right tools, you don't have the right education, you don't have those resources, it's harmful to your mental health in your job and you have more of those impacts on your mental health. Um, so, and then in 2019, we really moved forward with, um, and I touched on the scope of practice briefly already. We did a, a revision of that as well. We can do a crisis revision. During the pandemic, we actually did a, an emergent revision of the scope of practice to include tools for responding to COVID-19. In 2019, we published the EMS Agenda 2050 that really focuses on patient-centered systems of systems that are interoperable and collaborate across the spectrum. So 911, public health, healthcare. Eventually, we need to have our patient care records integrating so that a paramedic will know a patient's history, medicine, et cetera, and so that our 911 operator will know hazards uh, at a highway intersection. They'll know all of these different challenges um, from this integrated system of systems, sharing data, sharing information. And with next generation 911, which we are in the process of trying to move forward across the country, yes, there are parts of the country that don't have addresses. Yes, there are parts of the country that don't have basic 911, but we are really trying to strive and move forward the whole country to next generation 911 so that when we have crises like COVID-19, we can pivot. We had a 911 center in 24 hours implement nurse triage to reduce the burden of COVID-19 patients on their EMS agency. When we have innovative practitioners, medical directors, and collaboration between systems, we can do impressive things. 
We need to bring the crisis systems, EMS and 911 together to collaborate, to bi-directionally educate. So we understand we speak the same language to each other yeah. and we're able to help each other. So Kate, this is it's fascinating to see the evolution of the EMS system. And on the one hand, it is it, it is impressive to see how much how far we've come in such a short period of time. Because I, I think when most of us think about the EMS system, I think we take for granted, first of all, that it is uh, much more uniformly spread out across the country than, than than it probably is in some areas. But also we take for granted that it's just kind of always been here. And, and that's not the case. The other thing though, that comes to mind for me is that as we really look at this as kind of our template for how we pivot into this behavioral health response, we have such a long way to go to reach the level of efficiency uh, that we have in our EMS system. I think I saw where, I believe it was David put in the chat that it feels like we're somewhere around 1973 if we're looking at this timeline uh, with a behavioral health response. But 911 really really spent 50 years educating the public about dialing three digits. Um, don't underestimate the time it will take to move things forward in that education. You guys are already moving faster than we did because you're engaged with us and learning from our experience so that you don't recreate the wheel. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. Uh, we are going to move now to our, <clears throat> I believe we're going to move, get ready to move to our hot sheet. But before we get the hot seat, before we get there, just want to remind everyone about getting your jam session t-shirts. Uh, we do have five different versions of it with, they each have a quote on the, on the, on the back. Um, I have a nine, eight, eight t-shirt on today. Um, so I encourage you to get those. They are not only informative and fashionable, but they are guaranteed to give you leaner, tighter abs in minutes. So I encourage you to get one. So let's move on. Oh, and by the way, um, you, you just need, when you, when you order them, you just need to decide which color you want um, on your logo and then whether you want uh, Spanish or English version. And the, the uh, location has been dropped in the, in the chat um, for you to access the, uh, the 98 uh, t-shirts. We do have on the hot seat today, uh, let me see, who do we have? Oh, Dr. Elisa Ward, Director of Behavioral Health um, at uh, Virginia Medicaid. So uh, Dr. Ward, welcome to the hot seat. Welcome, I came in my 988 t-shirt, so I'm ready Excellent. to go, I'm in the official uniform. Yeah, and see so now as, as a, for participating on the hot seat today, you will actually get a new uh, 988 t-shirt. So you will add another one to your wardrobe. So this is the hot seat question that we have for you today. In 2017, JAMA Surgery published on the time between a 911 call and the arrival of emergency medical services. I'm sorry, this uh, thing just popped up and blocked. Uh, which they reported uh, respond in the US to an estimated 3, 37 million 911 calls every year. The question is, what was the average EMS response time to the scene of the emergency in the article? Was it A, seven minutes, B, 14 minutes, C, 21 minutes, or D, 28 minutes? So we invite the audience now to cast their vote, and we'll see what the audience results are. And you will either, you could go with the, uh, what the audience says, you could choose to, to follow the audience. You could also phone a friend. You cannot phone one of our um, experts, though. You can't call Kate and ask her, uh, but you can phone a friend. I can and it phone looks a friend. Like the, looks like the, right now, the, the audience is leaning toward 14 minutes at about 42%. I do think that I am gonna concur with the audience at CIT, who I think maybe they are all contributing to, who knows, uh, to 14 minutes. Well, this is generally a very smart audience. Um, is that your final answer? You're gonna go with the uh, 14 minutes. And the oh, answer in fact it was is seven minutes. Eight, seven minutes. It was a multiple of seven. <laughs> That's right, a multiple of seven. But thank you so much for participating today on the hot seat. And we do have a lovely parting gift for you in the form of a 988 t-shirt. 
And if anyone, uh, if anyone has any recommendations for hot seat questions for us that you want to participate in the hot seat, by all means, let us know. The, according to the response to the median time increases to more than 14 minutes in rural areas. So you were partially right. With nearly one in 10 waiting nearly 30 minutes, research suggests bystanders trained in first aid will help those requiring immediate care. So uh, on average of seven minutes does, does increase to 14 minutes in rural areas. Thank you so much. So I want to bring Kate back for a minute because we have some interesting information here from my um, uh, from the EMS website uh, that we want to talk a little bit about. Um, Kate, what are we looking at here? You're on mute, Kate. I, I knew I was going to do it at least once. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so when you're looking at like the average time for EMS activations, and, and so on, One to contextualize this, um, there's a lot of diversity in where we practice. So where I practice as a paramedic, if my unit is not out on the road within two minutes, we're replaced and another unit gets sent, we're expected to be there fairly quickly, usually around six minutes. Um, my brother was a trauma patient in Minnesota on an Indian reservation in a rural part of the country. The closest ambulance was 35 miles away. Um, so when, when you're in a different context, the, the, the response time is going to shift, it's going to change. Those of us in urban suburban areas are really spoiled oftentimes by pretty quick response times. But that also depends on staffing. It depends on them having enough ambulances. Right now we have a shortage in obtaining new ambulances and we have some shortages in staffing. So some communities are seeing that expanded a little bit. But from a crisis perspective, saying you, you're there in six minutes. Do you, it, it makes sense why an EMS community might respond to, well, we'll get there within two hours with what? <laughs> like, I, I've been on two more calls by the time you're going to show up at the house at that point. So yeah. understanding the expectations of these different communities is incredibly important. So 911 is expected to answer their calls very quickly because that next call that's coming in, they can't hold it for a long time because they don't know what it is. Yep. And 70% of our 911 centers have two people there. And it looks like um, they're responding with lights and sirens 84, is it 84.6% of the time? Yeah, so this is a trend that we're actually trying to change. Um, when you call 911 and they dispatch EMS in many communities, the default is to go lights and sirens to the emergency. And if you're having chest pains um, or your wife is about to deliver a baby, I could understand you wanting us to do lights and sirens to your house, um, but it increases the risk of crashes and it can in increase some risks for those providers so, as well as the patients. So there is a big trend right now to improve our culture of safety and to really move us towards only using those lights and sirens when they're very needed and they're gonna be critical to outcomes and doing the research so that we understand what those outcomes are gonna be. Oh, you're muted. You jinxed me. You jinxed me, Kate. So the, it looks like the predominant uh, response type is fire is the fire department. But understand, we also don't have necessarily good data on the community nonprofit response. Is that correct? Well, and, and what I want to clarify is when you're looking at the number of calls responded to, fire-based EMS responds to a large proportion of calls. But there's a huge proportion of our country that is covered by volunteer non-fire-based EMS that mm -hmm. really struggles to have access to the same funding streams that fire-based will have. And EMS, as Dan mentioned, can be provided by a whole bunch of different contexts or, um, or delivery models. So it could be fire-based, it could be a community volunteer ambulance service. It could be that it is based in the health department. It could be another government agency. It could be a for-profit ambulance company. It could be hospital-based. There's a lot of diversity in how it's done. So uh, it really, the statistics get a little dicey because it depends on what you're talking about. 70% of the country is covered by volunteer EMS. About 60% of um, Fire departments provide EMS services, 60 to 70%. So there's a lot of difficult numbers there and we need to improve our data. Yep. Well, thank you so much again, fascinating data. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, so this time we're gonna pivot to uh, a crisis talk. I know we don't have Stephanie Hepburn with us today, um, but uh, do we have Sue Murray on? 
don't know if Sue is on or not. Um, our, our, our guest for Crisis Talk today is Faye Bellum. Um, and the piece is on the sanctuary, a safe and homey space for people in crisis. Do we have Faye? The Crisis Talk article is in the link. Um, we don't, do we have Faye? If Faye is not here, um, then we'll, we'll move so forward. If Faye is not here, I'm, I'm here, I think, to speak about the sanctuary. Okay. Um, so my name's Emma Welsh. I'm Mental Health Crisis Concordat Manager for Cambridgeshire and Peterborough um, Integrated Care Board. So that's in the UK. Um, so I was asked to, to kind of give you a brief insight into the sanctuary and what it actually does. Um, so essentially, I'm responsible for the crisis mental health care pathway within Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, which is a county within um, the UK. Um, and what we have had is crisis alternatives for mental health um, crisis um, over the last seven to 10 years. And the sanctuary was one of those first that were introduced in our system. Um, we have a similar system of 999 or 111 as telephone lines that people can use in, in a crisis situation. 999 is our traditional one that would go through to the police, ambulance or fire service. 111 is a health-based response. Um, what we do is essentially, if somebody is in a mental health crisis, um, our view is that actually sometimes the emergency department or A&E as we would call it is not the place for somebody to be, that this is a way mm -hmm. of supporting people outside of that environment and particularly obviously with COVID it became even more of an issue around actually is this the appropriate environment for people to be in. So the sanctuary offers a, a safe space for people um, to de-escalate their mental health crisis. Essentially, if somebody calls an emergency line, it's like 999 or 111, they are triaged um, by our 111 option two, which is a mental health number, um, clinicians to see whether they are safe to be transported to that sanctuary. So the police could be out in situ with somebody, an ambulance could be out in situ with somebody, and they can divert that person away from being conveyed to the A&E department. Um, essentially, the person is taken to the sanctuary. It's a place where it's a non-clinical environment, as you can see from the pictures. It's a homely environment where people can essentially have one-to-one -one support for up to a couple of hours to help work through and make sense of their current emotional states and what things that they can do to improve their situation. Each contact that somebody has with the sanctuary is seen in isolation. It's that crisis in the moment and it's about how do we keep people safe for that period of time and then thinking about what they can do going forward. Um, it's staffed by um, people with lived experience in mental health, but also with people with experience in, in mental health, but not qualified clinicians. It's run by a voluntary sector, funded by NHS monies. Um, but it seemed very much as a, a kind of non-clinical environment because it reduces the stigma and kind of discrimination that sometimes is associated. So if you think if you were in severe mental health crisis and going into A&E, what a lot of our, our people report is that they're seen as, as a, a kind of, they shouldn't be there, whether they've self-harmed or, or tried to commit suicide or they're just, you know, in an extreme emotional state, they sometimes feel that they're discriminated against and they, they suffer from a stigma. So actually this environment prevents that because they're not judged, then they're, they're seen as somebody, as an individual and somebody sitting opposite them might well have been in that situation themselves and can talk th through the kind of crisis that they're having. Um, we offer a blended model courtesy of COVID now. It used to all be face to face, um, but now we offer virtual. So over a platform like this or telephone support. What we found is that actually that's increased our footfall as such, because in our area we have a, an urban centres, but a huge rural population. And so those people who, who maybe couldn't access the service by tra public transport, for example, now can access it via something like Zoom or by telephone support. Um, so I don't think there's anything else unless there's any questions or anything. No, thank you so much. We, we do have the link in the chat uh, for this article. Uh, you can go to talk.crisisnow.com. 
uh, slash the sanctuary, a safe and homey space for people in crisis. Emma, we thank you so much for coming on and and, um, and talking with us today. And I, I believe we're gonna in a in a future crisis jam, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about uh, some of the UK system. So thank you so much. We appreciate you being with us today. Thank you. And moving forward, I don't believe we're going to have anyone on for the SAMHSA update today. So we will, uh, we do want to thank our friends at SAMHSA for being partners with us. Uh, for the NASPID update, I believe we're going to go to Dr. Deb Pinels. And I believe uh, Dr. Pinels has a new role she wants to tell us a little bit about as well. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Vic. Um, hi, everybody. Great presentation. Super exciting. We can go to the next slide, I think. Um, yeah, I am now a senior medical advisor, senior medical and forensic advisor and editor in chief at Nashbed. Very exciting. While I'm maintaining, uh, maintaining my role uh, in Michigan, I've uh, reconfigured things. And I'm really excited today to tell everybody about um, the papers that are going to come out from Nashbed this year. Uh, we have the From Crisis to Care. This is a perfect uh, segue from everything we've been talking about as we build out um, as we build out 988 and all of its uh, component parts. This year's series is going to focus on how we move from crisis to making sure we have the right care in place for people who need it and also to prevent those crises in the first place. So we've got uh, the umbrella paper, which you'll see. Um, We've got updates on uh, bed capacity and bed trends. That's gonna be really exciting, looking at some data that hasn't been presented before uh, from Ted Letterman's group. We've got another paper looking at uh, the story of data that's coming out of the crisis continuum. It'll help many systems. Uh, uh, a, a paper about children and uh, youth uh, crisis response, uh, looking at three state models. They're where we spotlight Arizona, Utah, and Virginia. Looking at climate change, a really interesting paper on how climate change can impact behavioral health as a, a part of our disaster response uh, papers that we're trying to promote for people. Looking at self-care, self-directed care, the role of supported housing and other uh, support systems. Uh, the role of CCBHCs or, and urgent care um, is gonna be another uh, great paper. And then I'm really excited in the Lending Hands paper, looking at partnerships across EMS, police, and mobile crisis, um, that paper covered some of the things that were actually discussed today. So I think people will find these technical assistance papers really useful. They'll be on the Nashford website mid-September and very excited to be part of the team. Excellent, thank you so much. And congratulations again, uh, again on your new role. Um, NASPIT, I'm sure they're excited to have you. And I know you will just uh, be remarkable in this, in this new role. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pinals. Thank you. Want to remind everyone about the uh, Moving America Soul on Suicide series, where we look at uh, people who, who have uh, dealt with suicide loss and suicidality. So, do encourage you to tune into those. And then, also looking forward uh, to coming on September 7th, uh, we'll have Dr. Dave Jobes and Derek Lee uh, joining us on bridging the, the lethal gap between what we know and what we do. Research shows direct treatment of suicidality works, but evidence works, but evidence-based next day care with rapid stabilization exists for, for very few. So we'll have them um, coming to talk with us on September 7th. So we're looking forward to that. And here you have a quick look at some of the other things we have coming up. Again, we have Dr. David Jobes. We're looking forward to Dr. Uh, Christine Moutier being with us on September uh, 14th. Also reminding folks there will not be a crisis jam on October 5th uh, due to Yom Kippur. Uh, we will have our special edition 100th episode of the crisis jam on October um, 12th. So um, also looking, looking very, looking, uh, looking forward to that. Next slide. And um, I don't know if, if, um, Kate, if you if you're still on, if if there's anything that we that, that any uh, thoughts you want to leave us with, uh, we'd be more than happy to give you some some final thoughts. I just want to say thank you so much for the engagement. Um, please reach out if I can be a resource for anybody. Um, and I, I just you know want to applaud uh, my colleagues from the 911 community and EMS community, Stacy and Dan. Both are really dedicated, passionate advocates in our community for improving crisis response. So I think we need to all get 
together and collaborate on our advocacy and our education bi-directionally so that we can build an, a really improved system for everybody. Thank you so much. And we thank everyone for being with us today for our Crisis Jam. Uh, so be sure to join us again next week. Thank you all so much for being here with us. My name is Vic Armstrong. I'm Chief Diversity Officer at RNM International. It has been my pleasure to be your host. One, two, three. Bye! Bye.